Welcome to the podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Natalie. I'm Jen. And I'm Ginny. And we are the Art History Babes. Today, we are doing the second installment of our two parter on color theory. Woo woo, color. Color so theory. Much to say. There is so much to say. We I'm could. Exhausted by color theory. <laughs> <laughs> Colors. Colors. <laughs> um, yeah, we could go on forever and ever. There's so much to say about color. Our second episode, we're going to kind of dive into color theory and modernism, particularly Joseph Albers and his work in color theory. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about psychology and color, and then we're going to wrap it all up with Van Gogh. A <sighs> little, little bit about our man, Van Gogh. Our boy, Vincent. God, Van Gogh. We're just... We, we all just love, love you. you. We love you so much. Um, So our last episode, we talked a lot about color, perception, optics, a little bit about Isaac Newton. Uh, Then we got into the color blue. We went on some interesting tangents (laughs) with the color blue. Um, But we let... Angled up in blue. (laughs) Bob, I love you. It was was great. It was great, though. We learned a lot of things about blue. We had some good conversation about blue. Um, and yeah, so now we're kind of bringing it back around to color theory and how color theory relates to art. Um, so color theory, when you hear the phrase color theory, um, it is referring to how color is used in the visual arts. It is referring to how colors interact with one another and create certain effects. Some kind of basics of color theory, and this stuff's kind of confusing, But you may have heard of uh, additive and subtractive color. Additive color refers to when you start with black and you add light um, to create color. Uh, Subtractive color is kind of um, the opposite. It's you start with white and then you add colors. And the reason it's referred to as subtractive is because what happens is you end up with black. Um, because the color wavelengths absorb one another. So that's how it becomes subtractive. It's a little confusing. Like Mm -hmm. you're adding color, but it's subtractive, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you're creating visual art, you're either going to take kind of like an additive approach, which is like, honestly, like television and film is additive. You're adding light to something, whereas painting is subtractive. This gets really um, important also to printmakers in particular because they're constantly, depending on the particular type of printmaking medium, dealing with additive and subtractive medium. It Um, gets complicated. And speaking of printmaking, um, as we talked about in the last episode, your, your primary colors, your general primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. Those are your typical primary colors. But in printmaking and it, they're kind of like the new primary colors. It's just in like printing in general. You have the CMYK primaries, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And those are the primaries that you deal with in printmaking. Why is black K? I don't know. Just what? what it is i guess okay well, if you know out there let us know let us know why black is k yeah that'd be great um but cm so you have the um ryb red yellow blue mm-hmm. and then you have cmyk which is the primary colors of printing cyan magenta yellow and black um i keep mentioning joseph albers very important in the development of color theory um he was born in 1888 and died in 1976 um, he was an artist and an instructor, a modern artist. He uh, entered the Bauhaus in 1920, which is a very important institution for kind of the um, bridge between art and craft in the early 1900s. Um, he worked in a lot of mediums. He worked in furniture design. He worked in stained glass. So he's very interested in this intersection of craft and art. Um, He had a lifelong interest in problems of light and color within geometric forms. And if you've ever seen any of his work at a museum, like, that's very obvious. It's very, very geometric, very clear use of colors against one another, very intentional use of color. Um, So that was kind of of his his passion and what he um, 
was the most interested in really was color theory. He wrote The Interaction of Color, first published in 1963, and I'm going to read you a little bit of it. It's a fascinating book. It's super interesting from both, I mean, from color theory, from an artistic perspective, but also from just a philosophical perspective. It's super interesting. Um, So I'm going to start just kind of reading the first page of the introduction because I think it's really um, poignant. The book Interaction of Color is a record of an experimental way of studying color and of teaching color. In visual perception, a color is almost never seen as it really is, as it physically is. This fact makes color the most relative medium in art. In order to use color effectively, it is necessary to recognize that color deceives continually. To this end, the beginning is not a study of color systems. First, it should be learned that one and the same color evokes innumerable readings. Instead of mechanically applying or merely implying laws and rules of color harmony, distinct color effects are produced through recognition of the interaction of color by making, for instance, two very different colors look alike or nearly alike. The aim of such study is to develop, through experience, by trial and error, an eye for color. This means specifically seeing color action as well as feeling color relatedness. As a general training, it means development of observation and articulation. This book, therefore, does not follow an academic conception of theory and practice. It reverses this order and places practice before theory, which, after all, is the conclusion of practice. Also, the book does not begin with optics and physiology of visual perception, nor with any presentation of the physics of light and wavelength. So, was that written by Albers? Yeah. That is very quintessential um, vocabulary of the um, Bauhaus school. Definitely. They're just, everything they wrote was like a manifesto. Yeah, for (laughs) real, for real. So, the last episode, we went into all these things about color perception and science this both does apply and doesn't apply. This is kind of the modernist way of flipping all that on its head mm-hmm. and taking what we assumed color perception to be and playing with it, I think is the best way to put it. It was about experimenting and playing with it. Um, and that's kind of what this book does. It kind of lists these different experiments that Joseph Albers would do with his students Um, to get them to look at color differently. He would do different like experiments, different optical illusions that he would do. Um, One of the most common ones that you very well may have seen before is he would do the whole, um, he would take two rectangles of the same color and place them on different backgrounds. And this would result in the two rectangles looking like different colors. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like a a very common optical illusion that people will do to, to just kind of like mess with your perception, like, um, cause it makes you think that the rectangles are different colors, but they're not. Um, but he would kind of take it to a new level and he would have his students play with colors to find which colors would best achieve that effect. Like which colors would best create this contrast Mm. and best make you think that they were the same color or different mm. colors. And so it was all about, like, playing with different colors. So he was really big on, like, color mixture. And he um, worked a lot with his students with, like, paper instead of, like, um, paint, which is a kind of an interesting medium to play with color mixture on because you can't mix paper, obviously. <laughs> so, like, it. one quote from his book, like, in in relation to this whole, like, using paper to study color... He says, through this, or though this may first appear as a handicap, it is actually a challenge to study color mixture in our imagination, that is to say, with eyes closed. Hmm. So it was li- it was quite literally a way of him to say, like, I need you to see these colors in your mind and, like, work through them and play with them. He was all about color combinations, the different effects they had. A lot of his work, if you see, and we'll put a few of his images up on um, on our website, but he 
played with color and how it could create depth and layering. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of his work is very simple, but it, it just does really cool things optically. And that kind of relates to what got me on this whole color thing, which was the quilt exhibit I saw in San Diego. Right. Quilts and color um, at the San Diego Museum of Art, but it's the exhibit itself is from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, and the exhibit was really well done. It was all of these quilts, but it included like a color wheel. It included some history on Joseph Albers and like how he relates to all this. Um, the whole exhibit consisted of quilts ranging from like the 19th century into early mid 20th century. Mm. What was really fascinating and really just like striking about it is like some of these quilts did some really crazy things optically. Like you would look at quilts. I actually have, I bought cause I'm a, child of capitalism and i can't say no to art museum oh, i'm so bad i know i, I guess. spent a hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> at the met when Dang. i was there I can't a put a price ago. on culture <laughs> <laughs> and i bought a bunch of crap <laughs> but yeah art museum oh, gift shops I'm so oh that. god um but i bought these pins that i now have oh, on my purse so um thanks and they were from this quilt exhibit but like see look at this they're like these these three-dimensional squares and that like that's from a quilt like that's a quilt that looked like that. now are those like that's modern quilts or are they from like the old-timey quilting bees of the colonial <laughs> united states oh, 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 everyone God. has a picture in there kind of right in now. the middle like is it their 19th century through early 20th century. Okay. So we're not really talking past 1950. Okay. Um, and they're in, some of them have really dazzling optical effects. You're just like, damn, like that's a crazy quilt. Um, and it was from use of color theory and like putting these things to use, use in their craft, which was really cool and uh, inspired this episode. So that's kind of a little rundown on Joseph Albers and his contribution to color theory. I think we're going to shift into color theory and psychology. Mm-hmm. Oh, Hello, <laughs> um, Okay, so <clears throat> my main resource was this book that I found that I love. It has many editions, but it's called Art and Visual Perception, A Psychology of the Creative Eye by Rudolf Arnheim. And the artist that I looked at don't necessarily think of color in the same way as Alpers as far as using color specifically to express their ideas. Um, So I looked at Rothko, Mark Rothko, and also my boy Gerhard Richter, who I just love, um, for using being known as these kind of abstract um, expressionists who use colors and specifically they're really good crackers guys <laughs> um, specifically primary colors um in terms of Gerhard Richter's later works that really are associated with abstract expressionism who else you use primary Poussin used primary oh colors god. oh god <laughs> no. honestly <laughs> What do you have he to didn't say, have Denny? The, he didn't have the complimentary colors thing down. I dislike Poussin. I do too. <laughs> I'm not a big fan, but I do love what was the one, the main one. It's at the mini it's in Minneapolis. Germanicus? Death of Germanicus. Yeah. I like that one. Fuck. But you're but you're also you're the only person who's seen it in person. That's true. So that could be That's true. Yeah. That changes shit. Maybe it know. doesn't look as shitty and two dimensional <laughs> in real people, life. A, a lot of people hate on Rothko when you don't see it in person. Oh, no, Rothko in real life is transformative. It's it's, so it's a world good. apart from seeing it through a screen. This is, you know, something the internet cannot duplicate. It really is, can. But I think it's really easy to think of Rothko as an artist who's super focused on color. And it's interesting to start reading, you know, his own words where he emphasizes specifically that he's not. And I have this one quote that I thought summed it up pretty nicely. And he said, I'm not an abstractionist. I'm not interested in the relationship of color or form or anything else. I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. So this kind of segues into the whole idea of color and psychology because while we've already gone into length in episode one about how it's hard to link 
certain colors with certain emotions universally. There is definitely a connection between color and emotion. And um, <clears throat> it is important to note that color is the color spectrum is a sliding scale. So we've talked about the science, but the way that people see colors is technically differently and also the way that people interpret colors. If you think back to the, how do you say it, Rorschach? I always say it wrong. Yeah, okay. I think Rorschach, Rorschach is okay. correct. Okay, Rorschach tests. So, the, you know, the ink block tests. He, you know, he not only did he do tests with, I'm sorry, with um, form, but also with color. So he was kind of comparing the two. And he found that there are certain people who are kind of more apt to form domination in as so far as they relate to items and there are people who relate more to color dominance so you can kind of go one of two ways and I mean it's 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 really complex but if you're going to break it down there's form form dominated and color dominated and the people who show color dominance tend to have more openness to external stimuli Mm. so these people could be described as more sensitive um, easily influenced unstable disorganized uh, and given Stop to emotional outbursts. <laughs> okay, and this is where it gets a little personal because we have had conversations in the past amongst ourselves about our just personality types and tendencies toward how emotion. How weird we are. <laughs> and how two of us, who I will not specifically name, might be a little dead inside <laughs> because we don't feel emotions and as readily. T- and two of us are extremely col- color dominant. <laughs> Just side note, we're a really cool balance of two super emotional women and two very cool, cool-headed women. So, so on a side note, fuck gender stereotypes because we are like a platter of different... Yeah. combinations of personality well, well we've got we've got all the elements yeah. represented right here yes. yeah all yeah. four of them so yeah so then the contrast would be shape dominated or form dominated people um are kind of you could describe them as more controlled or unemotional so um Rorschach didn't go any deeper into this avenue but um a guy and I'm gonna butcher butcher his name but his name is Ernest Chan- Chanchel Maybe our boy Ernie took this idea a little bit deeper, and he decided that. Let me read my shitty handwriting for a second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what color something? Um, <laughs> Wait, let me see what you wrote. Where? Experience. Is it, it says, experience? It says experience. Okay. Okay. So color experience um, is it resembles like affect or emotion. So depending on the different person. Um, it can kind of be, and that's all I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> While Natalie is gathering her thoughts, I have a little thing to say about color theory. So we started <laughs> on white wine, and which is not white, by the way. It's kind of like yellowy. Which we know Jen does not like. But I like the way it tastes, so that's okay. Um, and, and now we're moving on to a red and the red is actually kind of like purple Mm. so you know what um, happens when you mix red and yellow what does happen i don't know i don't want to know you know you know Um, what happens my friends a gnarly wicked hangover (laughs) um and they won't tell you that in the color theory class um this wine is called textbook Yeah, which is delicious. That makes me think of another of another poem Poem I'd like to recite. Go for it, it, and then after that we'll come back to Ernest because I found my spot. Red wine goes to my head, (laughs) (laughs) makes me forget that I still need her. So sad. Red, red wine, it's up to you. All I can do, I've done. Memories won't go. Memories won't go. That's all I'll get into, but uh, that's from uh, UB40. So, um, o- OG um, goes to uh, Neil Diamond, by the way. Oh. oh, have you not heard Neil Diamond's Red Red Wine? It's no. so good. Okay, well, we, that's what we're gonna be doing Neil. immediately after this episode, for real. Okay, Neil. back to Natalie. Okay, so this goes. Okay, so back to kind of this idea of. I mean, I don't want to say, like, emotion versus, like, 
practicality or control, but it does kind of get down into that idea of, I liked the um, use of the term like external stimuli. So how things affect you, whether external stimuli really can affect you deeply or Mm -hmm. if it's something that that makes perfect Yeah, because that sounds, it's a lot better than acting like someone whose emotional is irrational or uncontrolled. It's it's not... As That's one of simple. the emotional ones. I'm triggered. Oh, oh. As one of the emotional <laughs> of the four. Um, I think that's actually perfect because I feel like I've said that to people before. I am like so overwhelmed by like external sim- stimuli yeah. all the yeah. time. I'm just like colors and shapes and music and art and dance. And I'm just and like honestly, I'm so mean, excited all the time. It's a, Yeah. If I see someone's face and it looks kind of weird, yeah. I'm like, do they not like me? <laughs> What's wrong? No, uh, yeah. I agree. It definitely it, it has and to do hard. my emotional um, responses to things very much have to do with the emotion of the stimuli I'm taking and being in, in and, and absorbing so much. Yeah. Of if you had any question stimuli. about who, which two were which, <laughs> shut up, Natalie. No, it's just like yeah, I walk no, into a space and it's just like I don't know. Honestly, if you've ever been to like a an art museum with me it's kind of ridiculous I'm just like ooh painting and then I'm over here and I'm looking at this I'm like oh I love this guy and then I'm just like I'm just like all over the place and it's just like it's. I cry sometimes I cry sometimes it's I almost prefer going to like art museums by myself. Me too. I do too. So I can just like put yeah. in my headphones and just like see. Mine is less emotional, <laughs> but it's the same kind of idea that I like to be alone. But it's much more like technical. Like I just like yeah. like I have to spend a lot of time with something. Yeah, I don't. I'm not able to just look at a a work of art and not know anything about it and feel some kind of emotional reaction to it. like a really profound one. Um, usually when I'm in museums I like museum fatigue is a totally real thing and it's a real so thing so much yeah and it's a real thing for art historians like it's a real thing for people that are really into art mm-hmm. um where after a certain point like the stimuli is like okay I'm done your brain's like all right you've seen enough yeah I don't I don't cry I feel like that, could be, that could be a whole like realm of curation is like trying to arrange a museum in a way to make people less burnt out like right. less quickly. I Does that make that's sense? That's fascinating that they about curation. Yeah. I, I they feel try. like that's what's going on with SF MoMA, everything I've yeah. heard about it. They're trying to make it really like contemporary and like, hey, listen to these baseball players talk about art. Or and you're like, or, okay. or the cast of Silicon Valley. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Is Ehrlich Bachman there? Yes. You can listen to the cast of Aviato. Silicon Valley <laughs> Aviato. tell you about the art at SF, SF MoMA. <laughs> So um, we're still in this place of emotion linked with color, and there's an idea that that shape dominance, re- or okay, I'll start with color. Color dominance is a more passive form of thought, so colors come in more passively and you feel them, and that's why it's linked with emotion, whereas form kind of takes a more active form of thought. So to understand forms, you have to think more actively. So that's why color is linked. Does does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So like, colors like and emotions sh- are both things that come over you without control. That sort of idea oh. of outside stimuli. Whereas form is something that you have to more actively process and work your way through. And that's why oh. I guess dispassionate would be maybe a good word. Like people who kind of. That's, so like the color is more inherent somehow and like shape is more learned. Like, if you're, like... Um, no, oh. it's just, like, different ways of thinking. So, hmm. whether, like, the way... It, it's, like, coming over you... Pa- so, you're being passive. It's... You're not mm-hmm. at all engaging with it. It just hits you. Mm-hmm. And, and you feel it. And yeah. it really gets to you. Whereas, form is something you have to more actively seek out hmm. the reaction you get from it. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, you don't look at does, a form yeah. and necessarily, like, have that inherent whatever it doesn't wash over you you have to work through it Mm -hmm. color is something that hits you the same way emotion does it can be inexplicable it can be without warning Mm. without want i mean it you know it just depends and but it's also something that can be entirely satisfying that feeling of not necessarily seeking it out but having it definitely you know it's not a negative thing it's just the different ways of getting something out of 
art or something visual. Hmm. And, and, and they, I mean, it's, it's so complicated because they work together and it gets super complicated when you get into patterns and whether a pattern is color dominant or form dominant. And mm. they, you know, you can mm. get into some really interesting ideas. I mean, everything basically works on a spectrum from simple to complex, whether mm-hmm. it's colors, whether it's patterns. It's just, it's all, it's all very interesting. And this could go on for much longer, but. Um, um, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's super <clears throat> interesting. It's a good way to think about how different people react to things in a scientific way that doesn't. I don't, I don't like when things are simplified to a point where it makes one seem right and one seem wrong. Yeah, well, you know, when they're, what you're it, saying, there's no hierarchy. It's, they're, they're related in a way. What you're saying about color and how it is somehow indicative of some sort of reaction or emotion is reminding me about our artist of the moment on this episode, which is Mr. Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh. Um, In case you didn't know. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you were confusing him with a different Van Gogh, (laughs) but we're talking about Vincent, okay? (laughs) And Vincent Van Gogh is somebody who has been the subject of a lot of intense study, not only among art historians, but also among fine artists. Um, (laughs) Psychologists, however, are very interested in Vincent Van Gogh because of his use of color. So um, before I get deeper into that, I have this really, since we're reading like poetry (laughs) or, you know, lyrics (laughs) to UB40 songs, I have a great, I have a great poem about Vincent Van Gogh. It's by my one of my favorite poets, Charles Bukowski. Ooh, oh, Bukowski! God, so Bukowski wrote. I love this him and poem. I hate him. I don't even know how to. I him. love him and I hate him and I love him. I know, mm-hmm. right? And that mm-hmm. describes my relationship with men. Anyway, <laughs> um, Charles Bukowski wrote this poem. It's called "Working Out." Van Gogh cut off his ear, gave it to a prostitute, who flung it away in extreme disgust. Van. Whores don't want ears. <laughs> they want money. I guess that's why you were such a great painter. You didn't understand much else. Ooh. And was that was that a burn? <laughs> it's sort of a burn, but I don't say. know if it's a burn. It's not really because Vincent Van Gogh was absolutely clinically obsessed with color. Um, how do we know this? We know this because <laughs> throughout his entire life, he maintained a constant dialogue with his brother, Theo, his little brother, who was also his patron and his main financial yeah. source. His brother really. Yeah. And then his brother's wife, after his brother died, really perpetuated his success. But that's a side note. Sorry. Continue. So Vincent and Theo had a very close relationship, and because of this, thousands of letters um, exist that um, Vincent and Theo wrote to one What's another. What's the collection? Letters to Theo, I think, is the collection of yeah, a lot of them. yeah. And I mean, it's super amazing, and the the, the letters are just great. And there's a movie actually yeah. that we need to watch. I think it's a book. There's, well, the movie's not, no, don't watch Letters to Theo, the movie. That one's dumb. But <laughs> the um, the movie I'm thinking about is a documentary, sort of. Um, but it's entirely images of, like, where Van Gogh, like, traveled and stuff. And so it's, it was made in, like, the 70s. And so it's this really kind of, like, artsy film of just different areas and and sort of, like, recreations of scenes in which Van Gogh would have, like, made, like, a tavern where it's all mm-hmm. dark and mm-hmm. people are drinking absinthe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so anyway, um, in this this film, it's entirely... It, the all the dialogue is just letters that Van Gogh wrote to his brother and um, voiced by some... Very talented British person. British person, yes, How absolutely. How did I know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I will, British voice everything. I will find God. the name of this film and we'll put it on the website. But back to Van Gogh and his obsession with color. So he studied intensely the artist Eugene Delacroix. Mm. So Delacroix, 
Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Delacroix. 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 You got it. I never studied French, so my bad. Good. But um, <laughs> I did for a minute. Good job. I'm still going strong on Duolingo. Oh, Killing hey. It. Good idea. I am 16% fluent. Oh. Duolingo, if you want to sponsor That's... us, we're, we're okay with We're that. totally cool. <laughs> we would cool. love to be sponsored by Duolingo. <laughs> I would put that Sunday. little bird on We're everything. We're biggest fans. <laughs> We're big fans. That of little green it. owl. Oh, it's an owl. <laughs> I think Sometimes you can an like owl. if you get enough points, I you can so. you can get like a little costume for him. Like he a little monocle. I've never gotten that many points. Yeah, you get enough points, you get a little monocle for him. It's so great. that is the sign of education. <laughs> Oh, the universal sweet. sign of intelligence. Does he get a, a top monocle. hat too? Maybe. Someday. Actually, I would want right. a bowler. Maybe. Can I get a bowler hat? <laughs> I'm gonna look you it up. Pick you keep hat. talking about Van Gogh. So <laughs> I'm actually a little um, interesting. Some little information on um, Delacroix. Um, he was a mo- very famous in France. Um, he's understood as a romantic artist, um, and the reason why he's so important is because his work really did inform a large portion of the impressionist circle which follows sort of this era of romanticism which that's not it's not a continual timeline there's all kinds of aberrations in the history of the development of different styles um but Delacroix was one of the first to um, develop his own art color theories, and these included juxtaposing spots of color rather than blending the two colors or tints together into a gradient. By doing this, Delacroix's strokes of color were then being blended by the eye of the viewer. So that's huge when trying to understand not only the work of Van Gogh, but also the work of the Impressionists in general, who were absolutely obsessed with light and color and how For the real. eye mm. is perceiving color and how we mix colors in our eyes mm-hmm. when we see two tones put together, um, which is fascinating. And so because of Delacroix's um, brush strokes um, and his technique, Vincent van Gogh then applied many of those concepts to his own color theory. And that is, it comes to be known as something called the law of simultaneous contrast. And the law of simultaneous contrasts is what I just mentioned, which is the act of putting two contrasting colors together in order to achieve optical blending. So this color theory can be seen in his works such as The Potato Eaters, which is a fascinating piece, um, one of his earlier pieces, and also in a later piece called The Bedroom. My parents used to have a copy of that. Of The Bedroom? bedroom. Yeah. I love that painting. That was like my first exposure to Vincent Van Gogh. Can I tell a story, a Van Gogh story? Yes. I was in Chicago. And there was a exhibit, a really amazing exhibit, at the um, Chicago Institute of Art. Or is it Art Institute? Great museum. <laughs> um, but they did this exhibit because they have one copy of the bedroom. Mm. And then another copy belongs oh. to the Van Gogh Museum. And I forgot who the third copy belongs to. Anyways, they did this exhibit. It opened in February. And it was the first time all three copies of the bedroom were going to be shown together. Whoa. Yeah. It was kind of a big deal. Um, And they did this exhibit. And actually, it was really cool. um, Airbnb. Like, they worked with Airbnb. And they recreated the bedroom. Like, in a room. And it was (laughs) really trippy. And, like, they... Take all my money. They (laughs) they rented it out to people. It was... I mean, I didn't actually get to see it. But I saw, like, pictures of it. You can can Google it. And it was really trippy. Like, because they recreated it to look like the painting. So, yeah. It was... There was a cool campaign. But, yeah. They showed all three uh, versions of the bedroom together. Hmm. Um, and it opened in February and I was there and on opening day, we were going to go see the exhibit. Right. And we go all the way down there and it's like a blizzard outside. It's snowing so hard and it's so unbelievably cold. Chicago in February, 
is miserable. No. <laughs> and it was Just so, no. so cold, so windy. I don't do cold. I, I've i already, yeah, I've already ad- adapted to West Coast ways, so, like, I wasn't even prepared. I was in, like, a tiny little coat. It's and amazing I was like, how quickly. I know, I right? Say, I was yeah. like, I should have known better. But anyways, it was so cold, blizzarding. It was kind of gorgeous because, like, falling snow is beautiful, but it was still, like, so cold. And so we get there. And um, there's a, a Starbucks right across the street. We, we stop in to get coffee. And there's a line all the way down the block in the middle of a blizzard. People outside Jesus. waiting in line outside of the museum all the way down the no, block. No, and people and get hyped over I Van Gogh. And I just like, we got our coffee and I was like, we're not going to stand in that line. We're going to come back tomorrow. And I like started to cry because <laughs> I was just like... <laughs> <laughs> because you were thinking about our pal Van exactly. Gogh. Exactly, he was so sad and he was so <laughs> depressed his whole life, and he didn't like sell like anything. And, and he like, was hungry, dude. Yeah, he was, and he just had like such a sad life. And for him to like, I just wish he could have seen these people like lining up in a blizzard to go see. <laughs> <laughs> to go see his paintings. It was just really emotional. No, <laughs> Honestly, yeah. this is a time where I wish that there was a camera suspended over us because while Jen and Corey are like crying right now, <laughs> Natalie and I are just like sitting here like Jenny was like on her androids. phone. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I was looking up. To be fair. <laughs> I, I do think at some point we should do an episode of, like, oh, female man. art patrons because um, Van Gogh's sister-in-law was um, Johanna Van Gogh Bunger, or Bonger, I don't know. Bonger. But she, I don't know, guys. But she was, like, very, very instrumental in making Van Gogh, like, a famous name because, as many of us know, he was not really an artist of, like, reputation or fame until after he was already dead. Man, I get really torn up about Van Gogh because... So do I, he's like, just regularly. He's, like, such a good guy, and, like, nobody, like, cares about his work. I know, but... I mean, they do now, but, like, at the time, he was, like, starting, and, like, no one cared, and his he was brother... Trying. Like, his brother was just, like, financing him, and he was just, like, why can't I... Sell? He sold, like, two paintings, and he was just hungry, and I... <laughs> and, he, and he made such beautiful art. <laughs> he was just like a hungry guy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm like crying and laughing. I, he, I'm really sad was, about He was going. hungry and he was emotional and he just like was sad. And you're just like, damn it. <laughs> you're like losing it. Well, what really bums me out about Van Gogh is that... um. <laughs> To this day, he's known as the crazy guy I know. who cut his fucking ear off. Which, by the way, oh, oh, I have a good story. I feel so bad because I just made like a joke about this on social media the other day. Wow, you need to get out of your own house, Natalie. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny though. No, but, but for real, okay, so the, the story goes that Van Gogh was probably schizophrenic and that he was a depressed, anxious, angry person, but one thing about Van Gogh is that he loved hard, and he had a best friend, you guys. He loved him. And he loved his best friend, <laughs> Paul Gauguin. It's aggressive. I know, but it's important. <laughs> Wait, but I want to talk about Paul Gauguin. Gauguin was kind of a piece of shit, and and Van Gogh would get like so hurt over his best friend being like very insensitive and just not being a good friend and making him feel like he wasn't, you know, a good artist. And so the story goes that Van Gogh cut his ear off and gave it to a prostitute. That is not true. There is evidence that suggests that Van Gogh actually had his ear cut off by Gauguin in a sword fight in a bar. And Gauguin and, well, Van Gogh felt so bad 
about this fight with his friend. And then he didn't want people to hate his best friend. Oh, my God. So he, <laughs> he swore an oath of silence to never speak of how Gauguin cut his ear off because it was his best friend. <laughs> It's like his best friend, and his and he loved his best friend so much. He was like, "I know you cut my ear off, but we're best friends, and I'll just lie and say that I was crazy and I cut it off myself." That's what happens. No, no, this is this is real. Literally throw any of you under the bus. You fucking cut my. Do you? Okay, like I'm. I'm. I have evidence to corroborate this. You've got the research. Yes. Okay. okay, This is gonna go on the website. No. I promise. (laughs) Um. But okay. Okay. Anyway, enough of that. But but the reason why this is important, the reason why this is relevant, (laughs) is because because (laughs) of of Van Gogh's association with mental illness and because of his uh, ear situation, um, (laughs) psychologists. (laughs) <laughs> have since wanted to find evidence of Van Gogh's mental instability in his works of art. Okay, we're mm-hmm. back. There there are several articles in psychological journals with abstracts and everything, like real articles that are um, very much trying to find a relationship between the increasing intensity of Van Gogh's colors in his later work and what we know to be his increasingly deteriorating... Does that make sense? Increasingly deteriorating? Yeah. Anyway, deteriorating mental state later in his life, which we have evidence of because of several um, periods of being institutionalized, um, letters to his brother... So it's safe to say that Vincent Van Gogh suffered from mental illness. Therefore, though, now much of his work is um, characterized as being so intense because there's a correspondence between his emotional intensity and the intensity of his visual representations. Um, So these, especially color, so the color and the intensity of the color and the quality of the line and all of the space, the way he treats his space, there's these really like disorienting, the name of the work eludes me, but um, the the interior of the bar with the oh, pool oh, table yeah, totally. and, and the light. So yeah. that work is, is very... Just, we'll post that on the Yeah, website. that work is yeah. very disorienting because of this, so like, just jarring yellow of the mm-hmm. fluorescent light over the um, pool table and the way that the space is at once deep but shallow. All of this evidence is... It's Night Cafe. Night Cafe mm-hmm. by Vincent Van Gogh. So the this evidence serves then to be like a potentially... Works as a potentially quantifiable link between his mental functioning and his creative output, which makes a lot of sense. According to some basic color theory, color has three physical dimensions, which are wavelength, intensity, and purity. According to a article on Psychology Art Journal, which sounds so interesting as a journal, I, I want to subscribe to it. Um, so according to this article, um, these three physical dimensions of color correspond to three psychological elements, which then become hue, brightness, and saturation. So Van Gogh's work shows a distinctive change in all of these psychological features, and therefore his intense the intensity of his color represents a change in his emotional experience. There's a lot of science behind this. I'm not discrediting it, but one must also consider Van Gogh as a great man of letters and he studied and he was obsessed with color for sure and to reduce van gogh's complexity in his understanding of color theory to being merely a reflection of his deteriorating mental state is so just Mm -hmm. it does no justice to the man and he he was very very red in color theory of his time one author to consider, someone that Van Gogh absolutely read, was the author M- Michel Eugène Chevreux. And his writings on color theory, 
really influenced Van Gogh as well as Delacroix. Mm -hmm. And so what we are left with was a man who, as his career went on, not a very successful career, but he continued to paint because he was so obsessed with color and he was so obsessed with trying to find some sort of fundamental truth through Hmm. color in his work that he continued to paint. And I read somewhere his output was so insane that he is reported to have painted 70 canvases in 70 days. Hot damn shit. It's probably hyperbole, but (laughs) you know, um, he painted a lot, a little bit about the bedroom Um, so this painting is from 1888, painted in October. It's one of Van Gogh's best known paintings, and it exemplifies this law of simultaneous contrasts. So Van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo and stated that the purpose of this work was to show expressive contrasting colors and translate them into emotion on to paint. So what we are left with today is not quite the way Van Gogh would have painted it. The walls, originally violet, have faded prematurely. Mm -hmm. The red in the purple paint faded, and it left behind a mostly blue tint. Due to that fading, the balance between the primary colors and their complementary contrasts is disrupted. But the painting has since been restored, and we have a pretty good knowledge of the way it was supposed to look. So the contrasting yellow of the chairs in the bed serves as a direct contrast to the violet of the walls. And this contrast draws your eye to the yellow, and the purple walls have this effect of softening the image, and therefore the work becomes smooth and sort of balances balances out and it becomes a soothing sort of scene which is not that characteristic of many Vincent van Gogh paintings and recently something very interesting that I came across was an article by the Smithsonian that suggested that van Gogh might have been partially colorblind so the Smithsonian had a installation where um, they had a room where people could go in and the room simulated what it would feel like to be colorblind. And in the room, they had a copy of Starry Night. And one author who wrote the blog, which I'm referencing here, stated that when he saw Starry Night through this filter of what it would look like to be colorblind or you know, color color deficient, as we've also heard it be called. He suddenly saw the work as a more, like, smooth, cohesive piece as opposed to this sort of, um, you know, there's there's some jarring uses of yellows mm-hmm. and greens, and, <clears throat> and there's times in certain works by Van Gogh where you're like, oh, God, like, why did he put that color there? It's so <laughs> blah. Like, it's just, it's just, you know, that sometimes... Some of his colors tend to like grate on the eye, mm. and um, what this what this author describes is a more serene scene of the starry night. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this isn't evidence necessarily that Vincent Van Gogh was colorblind in any way, but, but it's, um, a, it's it, an interesting theory. Yeah, yeah it is. definitely. And uh, back to this whole like um, idea of color dominance versus shape dominance, they talk about how people who are less color dominant can actually be more apt to depression. Hmm. So color Ooh. dominance, aka this this idea that you're a more passive hmm. thinker, like you let things come over you passively, is actually further away from depression. Which is interesting because that I feel like people tend to like the idea that emotional people are the ones that would get depressed. <laughs> and that's not what this psychol- well, psychologist Well, because there's also, yeah, there's also kind of this 
I mean, depression is obviously a super complicated thing, but depression yeah. can also result in like a lack of feeling, like mm-hmm. in a exactly right. so like because a numbness. and there are different reasons for it. But yeah, but that could be a reason is yeah. if you can't feel those things that colors ne- may necessarily yeah. allow certain people to feel, then that because the whole thing with being an emotional person that I think unfortunately like it, it does tend to get a bad rap sometimes. But, like, when you're an emotional person, you feel the good emotions really intensely, too, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, like, I don't know, it's not as scary as I think it's made out to be sometimes. And, yeah, I think depression can more be characterized by numbness than, like, feeling. Maybe a lack of color. If if Van Gogh, this is a big if, obviously, but if he was colorblind, that could maybe have some thing to do with his perceived depression for sure because yeah yeah i think it would be kind of cool to wrap up the episode with a um mention of the the new black have you heard of the new black it is called vanta black and it is the blackest black you have ever seen (laughs) (laughs) so is it blacker than obsidian it's blacker than black times is it blacker than a black hole um, maybe. <laughs> so, um, a couple things just about Vanta Black. It's the darkest material ever made by man, and it absorbs virtually all light. So, it mm. was developed by a British company. How does it do that? Okay, <laughs> I'm about to tell. I'm about to tell you. It was created by a British company called Suri Nanosystems to eliminate stray light in satellites and telescopes. But it has since gathered a following of artists, designers, and other curious creatives. Because we love wearing black. <laughs> curious creatives. I like I, yeah, that. that's cute, right? <laughs> so um, it's not a color. It's really not a color because the way that we understand color is that it is the result of the way light reflects off of an object into our eyes. So that doesn't happen with Vanta Black because the light is absorbed. So different light frequencies typically translate into different colors. But Vanta Black is not a color. It's a material. It's made hmm. of a forest, quote unquote, of tiny hollow carbon tubes, each the width of a single atom. How? <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand. Yeah. Someone explain this to us, please. Yeah. So according to the Siri Nanosystems website, a surface area of one centimeter squared would contain around a thousand million nanotubes. That sounds like a made up number. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that means that Vanta Black is the absence of color, which is crazy because this is essentially what we would see if materials weren't reflecting light waves. Hmm. So could it be that our universe is just really black and dark <laughs> Dude, and scary? In my wildest dreams. That's really interesting. That is really interesting. I really want like a dress made out of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Be crazy. This reminds me of another p- Poem. Oh, Jesus. It's not a poem, it's a song. You'll probably recognize it. I see a red door and I want it painted black. No colors anymore. I want them to turn black. I see the girls walk by dressed in their summer clothes. I have to turn my head until my darkness goes. Oh, and, uh, bless you. Yeah. And on that note... <laughs> I think that's a perfect way to wrap up our two-parter on color theory. Thank you all. Thanks so for thank you with us, guys. Thanks, Even guys. All the ridiculousness. I don't know. I think we literally I cannot don't know what go happened. on. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that was just a uh, a little uh, kind of peek into the world of color theory. Oh. Honestly, it could go on forever and ever and ever. Mm-hmm. Um, it hurts my mind. It does. Um, but we suggest you open up a bottle of wine and talk about color with your friends because it leads to interesting places. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being awesome. We appreciate all of you so we much. We love you. We do. So much Thank love. you. So and much love. Please appreciate Van Gogh. <laughs> you said that so softly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he deserves it. He deserves it. He was a good man. Go see a Van Gogh. Good night. 
from Cal.